H. Office of Animal Care and Use. Prior to her federal service, she was on the faculty of Pennsylvania State University. She has consulted, lectured, and published on various topics related to agricultural animal health and welfare, aquaculture, emergency response, and contingency planning, biocontainment and biosecurity relevant to animal program operations, research safety, and occupational health. Dr. Harper received her DVM from Louisiana State University prior to starting her professional career in large animal practice. After several years in clinical medicine, she enrolled in a postdoctoral residency and master's program in comparative medicine at the Pennsylvania State University College of Medicine. Dr. Leslie Colby, chair, vice chair, is a professor and senior director of animal resources and operations in the Department of Comparative Medicine or DCM at the University of Washington. In addition to her clinical instruction and research duties, her responsibilities include shared oversight of the daily operations of DCM managed animal facilities, as well as coordination of the renovation design and construction of research facilities. She is board certified by ACLAM, is the vice president of ACLAM, a past president of the ASLAP, and is a member of the ALAC International Council on Accreditation. Dr. Colby received both her DVM and MS from the Virginia, Maryland Regional College of Veter Veterinary Medicine. Over to you all. Well, thank you for the introduction. I hope the audience can hear us better. We've had a few technical difficulties this morning, but I think we're, we've been able to resolve them. Now, during this session, Leslie Colby and I are going to discuss the results of a survey our committee also conducted in preparation for this workshop. When we decided that we wanted to do a survey, we weren't aware that FASAB had already conducted a similar survey. And in hindsight, it's interesting to see how the two surveys compare. I'd like to say this was a, our plan from the start, but in reality, it's mostly luck that we have the advantage of having two independently conducted surveys co for comparison. Next slide. Our work was guided by a statement of task, the sponsor USDA APHIS Animal Care provided to the National Academies, which is relatively state straightforward. We were asked to organize a workshop, the one that you're currently attending, to help the agency better understand the successes, challenges, and lessons that research programs with animals have learned since the contingency rule was implemented. The results of that workshop will be published as a proceedings and brief intended to help the sponsor estimate the rules impact and where additional tools and guidance are needed to assist stakeholders affected by the rule. The specific objectives are listed on the right side of this slide and focus on understanding some of the terminology and phrases that appear in the rule, such as reasonably be anticipated and expected to be detrimental to the health, good health and well-being. What exactly do these phrases mean and what standards are going to be used to determine if programs are successful meeting them? Comparing how different institutions have implemented the rule, learning about training programs for staff affected by the rule, specifically what are the defining characteristics of training programs considered to be successful and effective? How effective are full-scale exercises that evaluate a program's interactions with its local, regional, and federal agencies? How is active learning being used to train staff? What type of research has been done or should be conducted to further enhance contingency planning and personnel training? What are the roles of various groups or individuals who work in the animal program and at the institutional level as they pertain to contingency planning? hearing and learning about the experiences, challenges, and successes of others who have successfully implemented the contingency role, and finding out what other resources and references are needed to improve stakeholders' compliance with the rule. Next slide. The names of the committee members who worked with me during the planning of this workshop are listed on this slide, and I want to acknowledge and thank each and every one of them for all of their efforts. We all worked very hard and on a relatively short timeline to organize this workshop. And I just want to say that this group has been amazing to work with and that I feel very fortunate and proud to have been part of this team. Next slide. So here we have the timeline for this project. And as I just mentioned, we accomplished a lot in a relatively short amount of time. 
The committee was assembled in February, and one of our first decisions was to develop a survey to collect information about the rules impact on stakeholders. <clears throat> we developed a list of questions we wanted to ask, which then had to be reviewed by the National Academy's Institutional Review Board before we could distribute them. We received approval and the survey was launched on April 23rd and closed on May 12th. While the data was being collected, we also put together the remainder of the program and recruited some excellent speakers to tackle the various topics we identified. <clears throat> and after the survey closed, we began analyzing the data that was collected. All this information, and we're looking forward to hearing from those of you in the audience uh, to incorporate your comments, feedback, and questions during the workshop into that report. Therefore, I invite, oh, I'm sorry, can we start over? I just screwed up. Yes, I don't need to redo the recording, but you can you can start your, your talk at any time and I will edit this out after, so. Do you want me to start from the start? I'm sorry. No, 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 you can just start. Do you want to restart just from this slide? Okay. <clears throat> okay. I'm unmuting again. I need to take a drink. My throat's getting froggy. Okay, so I'm starting with this slide on project timeline. <clears throat> okay, so here we have the timeline for this project. And as I just mentioned, we accomplished a lot in a relatively short amount of time. The committee was assembled in February, and one of our first decisions was to develop a survey to collect information about the rules impact on stakeholders. We developed a list of questions we wanted to ask, which then had to be reviewed by the National Academy's Institutional Review Board before we could distribute them. We received approval, and the survey was launched on April 23rd and closed on May 12th. While the data was being collected, we also put together the remainder of the program and recruited some excellent speakers to tackle the various topics we identified. And after the survey closed, we began analyzing the data that was collected. All this information will be captured in the proceedings and brief that will be prepared at the conclusion of this workshop. And we're looking forward to hearing from those of you in the audience to incorporate your comments, feedback, and questions during the workshop into that report. Therefore, I invite all of you to actively participate. During the workshop, you'll have the ability to ask questions and make comments, and this is your opportunity to contribute and potentially influence the outcome. Next slide. This slide recaps the survey process beginning when our committee was assembled in February 2024 and all the steps involved before the survey could be distributed. Our goal was to keep the survey response time to 15 minutes or less in hopes that we would have broader participation. And we also did some quick beta testing before the survey was released to make sure all the questions were clear and that the survey was as brief as we anticipated. And at this point, I need to express the committee's sincere appreciation to all the organizations that are listed on this slide, specifically ALAS, ACLAM, ACVPM, ALAC, and ABSA, for their help in making sure that this survey reached a large, diverse audience within a relatively short time frame, We received more than 200 responses, but limited our analysis to 195 respondents who indicated, and that we were able to confirm through other program demographics and animal data, were in fact associated with a research animal program registered with USDA. I should disclose that the surveys were anonymous and we did not set any limits on who could respond. So this left open the possibility that we could receive more than one response from the same organization. However, after scrutinizing the data, which I've spent many days doing by now, I don't think this was the case because the responses we received appeared to be adequately stratified suggesting that the pool of participants was adequately diverse and not overrepresented by members of a single program or group. Next slide. We used a screening question to determine if a respondent was associated with a research animal program and whether that program was licensed or registered with USDA APHIS. Nearly all of the respondents indicated they were, and we also found a few who responded no to this question provided contradictory responses to other questions, such as the number of animals they had or the species they worked with at their institution. 
suggesting to us that they may have misunderstood or misinterpreted what was being asked. Next slide. We were also interested in knowing what types of organizations participated and asked each respondent to assign their institution to one of five different categories. This slide shows a breakdown by percentages of those different categories. You'll notice the number of commercial programs, which we defined as representing animal vendors, which is much smaller than the other categories. So we merged programs identified as commercial with those identified as industry, which primarily included pharmaceutical and biotech programs for the remainder of the analysis. Programs representing academia made up the largest percentage of respondents, and we further divided those programs according to their presumed size into small, medium, large, and unknown, based on the types and numbers of animals they reported. We received the highest number of responses from academic programs that we characterized as being small. The category described as other represented animal programs that reported being private or nonprofit research institutions and hospitals. Next slide. We were also interested in knowing each respondent's role in the animal program as shown in this graph. The highest number of responses came from veterinarians followed by individuals serving as IACUC administrators. Respondents identified as other included safety professionals and staff who were assigned or fulfilled more than one role in the animal program. So this would include the scientist who also serves as an IACUC member or the scientist who is also an organizational leader. Next slide. And this is a breakdown of respondents for various types of institutions. You can see that veterinarians were the dominant component in all of these groups and participation among the other roles varied. Looking at the government sector, none of the respondents was an animal facility worker and no IACUC members responded in the other group. Next slide. We then asked each respondent to indicate the types and estimated numbers of animals at their respective institutions, which we used to confirm they were associated with an, or an animal research program. And we also used that data to roughly estimate their size and complexity of each of these programs. Institutions range from those that were relatively small with only one or a few species to those that were much larger and had many more animals in total and also a wider range of species. Next slide. To further define survey participants, we asked if they knew about the contingency rule and its requirements and found that over 90% indicated they were familiar with the rule. However, an interesting side observation is that many of those who indicated they did not know about the contingency rule also responded that their institution did have a contingency plan. Next slide. We then asked each respondent to use a five-point scale to rate their experience, understanding, or interpreting the contingency rule. More than half indicated they found the rule moderately or very easy to understand, whereas only 12% indicated they found it moderately or very challenging and difficult. Next slide. Exploring that a little farther, we looked across different organizational types to see if there were any differences based on the type of institution. In every case, over 50% of respondents from all the different categories of programs found the rule to be moderately or very easy to implement. The range of those finding it the most challenging was much lower, ranging from 10 to about 22 or 23%. Next slide. <clears throat> We looked a little closer at these differences based on each respondent's role in the animal program and found there were some variations between groups. If you focus on the green band in this graph, which represents a neutral perspective, neither too difficult or too easy, you'll notice that its position shifts along the x-axis. Uh, the group referred to as organizational leaders reported the highest percentage or level of difficulty, whereas those in research roles reported the lowest. 
And what's interesting is that most of the participants in these groups indicated they were not highly involved in the contingency planning process. However, they still had opinions. Next slide. Respondents also provided pretext comments and feedback based on their own challenges interpreting the rule, some of which are captured on this slide. Many felt the USDA rule was not overly burdensome because their program already had an established disaster plan based on recommendations in the Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals. Because NIH OLA, which is the Office of Laboratory Animal Welfare, and ALAC International rely on the guide, having a disaster plan is already a requirement in order to obtain a PHS animal welfare assurance and to maintain accreditation. And some participants wondered if the same criteria used by these organizations also satisfied USDA's requirements. So in other words, if your disaster plan is acceptable to OLA and ALAC, will it also be acceptable to USDA? And if not, what are the differences and why? A few also commented that the USDA's expectations were a little confusing, questioning if USDA intentionally used the term contingency plan instead of disaster plan to emphasize there were subtle but distinct differences. There were also some respondents who objected to the use of terms like detailed evaluations, which they felt was too subjective and could lead to different interpretations and the expectations in terms of records that they kept to document when plans were reviewed, the results of those reviews, any revisions that were made, and how employees were trained and assessed. Next slide. Most programs, almost 90%, indicated that they did have a contingency plan specifically for the care and management of animals during an emergency. However, this percentage is probably higher based on their responses to other parts of the survey, um, given by uh, those who, indicated, who chose not to answer this question. Next slide. Respondents were asked to describe how they contributed to the contingency plan at their institution, by noting their level of involvement in all the various plan components. This graph shows that breakdown with the largest number of respondents reporting they participated in the development and or review of plans. By comparison, involvement in training was much lower with only 18% of participants reporting that they had contributed or, or were responsible for training. Next slide. This graph further breaks down the level of involvement across various roles in the animal program. Contributions by veterinarians, organizational leaders, IACUC members, and those in the other category, which includes your safety professionals, was relatively even for all of the functions listed, whereas researchers were less likely to participate with developing plans or providing training. Next slide. Some additional information we learned is that most plans covered all species of animals rather than being focused exclusively on regulated species, and a high percentage of plans included extra components that were not specifically required by the contingency rule. Although we didn't have enough detail provided to fully understand what was meant by having extra components or what they entailed. Most plans were also developed by a multidisciplinary team, which almost always included veterinarians and animal facility staff. And most programs reported that the time required to develop their plan frequently exceeded 20 hours, which is the highest amount of time involved for any of the activities that we surveyed, and is also significantly longer than the estimated time of four to six hours to develop a plan which the USC USDA had anticipated. Challenges that were identified included not being able to anticipate every possible emergency that might affect your institution's animal program, and also developing a plan that is sufficiently detailed, but also allows enough flexibility for the response team to change course if that's necessary while an emergency is in progress. And I'll share just a few of the actual quotes that were provided. It's difficult to write a contingency document to cover all possible situations, especially when the list of species in a facility is constantly changing. 
it's difficult to understand how specific the details should be for something that needs to be fluid and easy to adjust depending upon the circumstances. And delineating what is required versus what is recommended is has been difficult. Next slide. Here's a breakdown of the amount of time that our respondents reported was necessary to develop plans. And you'll notice that half indicated more than 12 hours was needed. Again, that exceeded USDA's estimate. Generally speaking, respondents participating in the survey across all organizational types spent the most amount of time and effort developing their plans as compared to other equally important procedures such as reviewing and revising plans, implementing plans, and training the response team. Next slide. We asked about APHIS Form 7093 and found that about 66% of our respondents knew about this form, which, as you've heard, USDA provides as a template to assist programs with developing plans. Of those who knew about the form, nearly half used the form as either a template or as a reference document to build a plan, with the remaining half choosing not to use it. Based on the feedback that we received, we found that there was some confusion as to whether this form is mandatory or optional for use, even though it's labeled as optional. And many commented that they found the form difficult to complete. Next slide. When asked how often contingency plans are reviewed and, and potentially updated, responses range from semi-annually or twice a year to every three years, with some respondents saying that their plans are reviewed as needed or at unspecified intervals. However, most programs indicated their plan was reviewed at least annually. Veterinarians and IACUC members contributed to most of the review effort with about 71% of those who responded indicating that the reviews could be completed in less than eight hours. Some of the challenges that were reported included not knowing who is the best qualified or who is responsible for reviewing plans, what criteria or elements should be included in the review process, and how the reviews need to be documented. Next slide. About 79% of survey participants indicated they had revised their plans since the rule went into effect in July 2022. The top reason given by most institutions is that, according to the regulations, their plans must be reviewed and updated on a regular basis. However, some institutions also revised their plans specifically because the USDA contingency rule went into effect, or there was an event or internal review that identified focused areas that needed to be updated, or the animal program had changed in some way that was significant. And sometimes plans were updated and modified to incorporate new information and technologies that the institution acquired through experience or through interactions with colleagues and subject matter experts. Next slide. Okay, so throughout the survey, many questions and concerns were expressed regarding training. In fact, I'd say it was, uh, I would say it was the topic prompting the largest number of open field comments and issues related to training were raised in nearly all parts of the survey. But first, let's look at the methods programs are currently using to deliver training. So in this slide, types of training modalities are listed on the Y axis, while the X axis indicates how many times that modality was selected. Respondents were allowed to select as many modalities as was appropriate to their institution. It should be noted that 26% of survey participants did not answer this question. However, for the 73% who did, this slide shows that a large proportion of programs are utilizing didactic or lecture-based instruction, either in a group or a one-on-one -on -one setting. Smaller numbers provided interactive training in a group setting, while others utilized remote instruction, including those conducted in real time or recorded for asynchronous viewing. Other programs provided instructional materials, such as copies of their written contingency plan, for their personnel to review independently. Very few programs involved individuals external to their institution in their training efforts. Next slide. Interestingly, over 40% of those who answered this question indicated that their programs utilize only one training, loadout, training method. So, for example, they only provide didactic instruction or they only provide web-based recordings. On the other hand, roughly 
um, an equal number of programs appear to be utilizing two modalities. However, some respondents commented that the type of training a person receives can be influenced by scheduling issues, such as for personnel who are absent or unavailable during a program's regularly scheduled training session. 14 respondents reported use of self-study training, which we interpreted to mean independently reviewing components of the written plan or associated SOPs and guidelines. Of these, seven small academic and government programs used self-study exclusively, while five used self-study in tandem with another modality. Next slide, please. Across all organization types, so say academia, industry, government, most programs take one to four hours to prepare and conduct training for their staff. However, the proportion of respondents in indicating four to eight, eight to 12, or greater than 12 hours was higher for government or academic institutions. In fact, all respondents who selected greater than 12 hours represented government or academic institutions. There could be multiple explanations for this, including the size of these institutions' annual care programs and the number of personnel. Next slide. <clears throat> Not too surprisingly, most respondents indicated that the staff at their facilities have received training regarding their roles and responsibilities pertaining to the institution's contingency plan. As you recall, the contingency plan rule or contingency rule required that all personnel be trained to their institution's contingency plan within 60 days of its implementation, and it defined maximum timeframes for the training of new hires and retraining of all personnel following significant changes to that institution's plan. As this table shows, most institutions appeared to meet those time requirements, but a small number did not, or at least the respondents weren't aware if or that they had. Related to this topic, it should be noted that multiple respondents commented that the amount of time institutions have to train their personnel is too short and thus represents an undue burden and should be extended. Next slide, please. Another question sought to get at how institutions are evaluating the effectiveness of the training that they provide. So how do they know if their personnel are obtaining and retaining the information and skills needed to properly respond to an emergency? Respondents were allowed to select all of the options that applied to their institution for this question. Observations and stakeholder feedback were most commonly selected, while tester quizzes and standardized surveys were also represented. Some of the responses in the open field other category appeared to fall into one of the existing choices, such as a tester quiz. However, numerous open field responses indicated the effectiveness of training was either not evaluated or that it was evaluated through personnel's performance during real life emergency responses. Next slide, please. Respondents indicated that they had multiple questions and uncertainties regarding training requirements associated with the contingency plan. So basically how to remain compliant with the regulation. Many respondents were uncertain of the USDA's, expe USDA's expectations of them and their training programs, such as on the topics of who is required to receive training. Should that be only those who are directly involved in the disaster response? Then others who may not directly participate in a response, but who are responsible for oversight of those individuals or for providing necessary resources? Is training required of researchers? How often must training be provided? Are there any specific type or topics of training that must be included? For situations in which a large range of emergency situations could arise, so for example, HVAC failures, plumbing failures, multiple natural disasters, do they need to demonstrate training for each type of incident or is a more general training acceptable? And also how and to what level of detail must training events be documented? To be clear, in my interpretation of the responses to this question, I don't believe individuals were necessarily, necessarily wanting guidance on what constitutes a minimally acceptable emergency response training program. Rather, they wanted guidance on what they needed to include in detail in their contingency plan and associated documentation to demonstrate that they were compliant with regulation. Next slide, please. Participants were asked to identify the parts of the contingency rule they found most difficult to implement. Of the 12 respondents, which is a relatively small number of all participants, the most commonly identified issues centered around training, specifically how to develop, evaluate, and track training programs, and determining who specifically must be included in the formal training program. Identifying the supplies and resources that would be required during an emergency response was also commonly selected. 
This was likely prompted as programs were trying to determine how their responses and needs could differ substantially based on which and a wide variety of incidents they may have to face. Another common concern expressed throughout the survey and as right in response to this question was uncertainty in the USDA's expectations of the scope and details that a program needed to include in their written contingency plan. Next slide. So now turning from uh, contingency planning implementation to activation. Most respondents indicated that their institutions had not activated the contingency plan since July of 2022. However, 28% of those who answered this question of 20, however, 28% of those who answered this question, which equates to 48 respondents say that they had. Of these, most experienced one or two incidents, while a few experienced three, four, or even five or more incidents. In total, at least 84 incidents were reported by respondents. It should be noted that individuals or programs may have different thresholds for what constitutes an incident or event requiring activation of the institution's contingency plan. For instance, localized flooding from a leaking pipe or a loss of HVAC function to a single room may prompt one institution to formally activate their plan, while at another institution, these same events, while not viewed as any less urgent or important, would be considered more business as usual and not prompt formal activation of their plan. Next slide, please. So to the question, what types of incidents occurred since 2022? This slide shows the type and number of incidents that were reported by the respondents. Natural disasters and utility and HVAC failures were most common, while fires, security incidents, other equipment failures, and animal escapes were also reported. Next slide. Overall, respondents reported that their contingency plans did perform well under emergency conditions. Only 12 total respondents, or 7% of all respondents, reported encountering difficulties. Most of these respondents were from small academic institutions, and they cited more than one possible cause of the difficulty, as opposed to a single precipitating event. In general, Respondents rated their plan's performance as excellent or good in four specific aspects, including the plan's overall performance, identifying specific tasks and responsibilities that had been performed or fulfilled, recognizing individuals' roles within the emergency response, and understanding and implementing an, organi an organized chain of command. With that said, the rankings of some respondents indicate some room for improvement in these areas. Next slide, please. Approximately 12% of programs reported experiencing emergencies that they had not anticipated when designing their contingency plan. This is not too surprising as it really isn't feasible to foresee every strange event that can occur. Programs did use these and other lessons learned to update and refine their plans. Of those who did activate their contingency plan, approximately 26% interacted with external authorities such as police or fire department. Most describe those interactions as being positive and over half describe them as well-coordinated and effective. This is interesting as other respondents throughout the survey hinted at respondents' desire to receive additional guidance on how to interact with external authorities and emergency responders, which I'll mention again in a few slides. Next slide, please. In addition to trying to learn more about how programs have designed, implemented, and activated their contingency plans. Through the survey, we also wanted to learn more about any additional resources or guidance that programs might find helpful. As part of this, respondents were asked to select the types of additional resources they believe would be most beneficial to their programs. The graph shows the relative frequency of each of the resources listed in the bottom legend, um, that were selected by respondents from the different types of institutions. The top bar shows this information from all respondents, regardless of their institution type. In general, centralized FAQs, videos and online courses, examples of good written plans, and references of best practices were most frequently suggested. While still selected by some, technical notes and especially in-person training events were less popular. Only moderate variations were noted when the respondent responses were sorted by institution type. Next slide. Open field responses to the question of what additional resources would be helpful included 
example practical contingency plans, meaning examples of written contingency plans that were shown to be useful during real world events. Recommendations for strengthening training programs, such as examples of different ways in which training could be provided, as well as recommended training components. Templates and tools to conduct tabletop exercises. Clear guidance on how changes to existing plans should be documented. And lastly, guidance on balancing the protection of human safety with the protection of animal safety and welfare, while still being viewed as compliant with contingency rules. Next slide. Lastly, we gave respondents an opportunity to provide comments on any topics of their choosing. While there are too many to review as part of this brief presentation, a few comments were repeated either in responses to this specific question or in responses made across multiple survey questions. Before kind of talking about some of those, I did want to point out that many institutions did indicate that they had established disaster plans. Therefore, they found it relatively easy to fulfill contingency plan requ contingency rule requirements. Based on multiple comments, there appears to be some confusion regarding the content or wording of the contingency rule itself. Namely, a couple questions implied that their authors believe that the written contingency plan required by the US USDA must be unique, a unique document that what institutions often call their disaster plans or emergency response plans could not be recognized by, could not be recognized by USDA to serve as their continuity plan. Some responses also suggest that, that there was a misunderstanding that the use of the APHIS Form 7093 is a requirement when in actuality its use is optional. A couple commented that it would be useful to have greater clarity regarding the requirements and recommendations pertaining to disaster plans as indicated in multiple documents or by select groups, such as the Contingency Rule, the Guide for the Care and Use of Laboratory Animals, the Animal Welfare Act, OLA, and ELAC. A comment was also made about the importance of animal-specific emergency response plans integrating well within institutions and possibly a city's or region's larger emergency response plan. Next slide. Other comments included the need to keep emergency response plans relatively simple so they can be nimble and easily adapted to unanticipated and changing conditions. This implies that written plans should not be overly detailed. Again, many comments were made both in response to this final question as well as throughout the survey regarding the need for additional training resources and recommendations. As mentioned earlier, some felt that the limited amount of time institutions are allowed to train new hires or retrain existing personnel following the plan's revision is too short and should be extended. And lastly, respondents appeared to recognize the value of involving external emergency response personnel in their plan development, revision, and training but we're uncertain how to initiate this process, as well as the level of involvement they should expect or request of these personnel. Next slide. I did want to take the opportunity to thank everyone who responded to the survey and the organizations that distributed it to their membership. Due to time constraints of the workshop, the survey was only open for a very short period of time, but despite this, we received a large number of responses with many insightful comments. Lastly, I do want to mention that these slides, as well as the survey results, will be made available on the workshop webpage very soon. And with that, I'll turn it over to Nia. Thank you for that. Now we'll take a couple of questions. Um, this These questions will be directed to Naomi, Susan, and Leslie. Um, the first I have is a comment, and it says it takes a lot of coordination with EH and S and other entities, but we did a tabletop exercise after we created our plan and it was very useful. We hope to do another one this year. It helped a lot to identify weaknesses we did not foresee. Anyone wanna comment on that? Um, I actually appreciate that comment because we had a lot of that come through in our survey as well. And we feel like that's something that could be implemented across different institutions is this need to debrief after after an emergency and really figure out what worked well, what did not, what what were the pain points, what were some of the challenges that we need to work through, and that can maybe be used to help facilitate other institutions, maybe those that have less resources to to figure out how they can better prepare. So I do appreciate that comment. We saw that a lot. 
And I'll piggyback on that too. And I think um, sometimes like we tend to get tunnel vision. Um, you know, we look at things from our own perspective um, based on our experience and our discipline that we, uh, and I think it's always better to include uh, people from different backgrounds with different experience who focus on different things and may point out um, things that we were sort of blinded to. So including a diverse multidisciplinary team is always a good idea. And one more comment, having multiple modalities that people are using for their training. So, you know, didactic can have its place. Reading the plan has its place um, in order to, you know, having maybe uh, um, tabletop exercises, maybe some actual on the grounds, boots on the ground exercises are also, they're all going to point out different uh, points of your plan and things that might need to be improved. So as much as people can cross their training efforts, I think it's probably best. And if I can just put in a plug for day two of our workshop, we have a speaker who's going to speak on different training modalities tomorrow. Another question, this is for our author of you all as well. Any theory as to why some of the plans take 14 plus hours? Is it due to committee working? That's in quotes, committee working, lack of clarity or something else? I'll do one possible thing is different sizes and complexity of institutions. So if you're an institution that has one room of animals and two investigators, um, maybe it's not going to take quite so long. If you're at a you know, large, say, academic institution, you might have 17 different buildings, 12 different species, some of which can move, you know, be relocated, some that could not. Um, so I think a lot of it could be the complexity and the size of the institutions. And I'll also piggyback on that and say that I think a lot of times we're trained to look for details just because of the nature of our work and um, reviewing protocols and policies and things like that. So we tend to um, maybe agonize and try to make things perfect. Um, I think that, that that's just the nature of the people that work in the, this industry. So of course, you'd want your plan to be perfect because that's the first step. And so I think that there's a tendency just to invest more time in it. Yeah, I agree with with all of that. And I, I will say, though, it, it could be maybe difficult to discern from the data itself how people did time the how they qualified the timing that it took to create these plans. And it might differ across institutions, but seeing how much time so many facilities used is really a testament to how much they care about the animals. I think they really were overthinking it. They really were trying to prepare and, and be be thinking of all possible scenarios, which is hard to do. It's a contingency plan. Um, but I, I think that was also encouraging to see, even though it is burdensome in a way, but also encouraging to see the commitment level from so many different um, facilities. Thank you for that. And I have another question. This is for both surveys. What are some of the key considerations that were used to develop the survey tool? So I think we based our survey a lot on the statement of work, the different things that um, we were asked to sort of focus on during this workshop. And um, the idea came up that as we were going through this, it would be nice to know uh, one of the things was, you know, has this been a burden on the um you know, stakeholders, and it's, it was tough for us to answer that since we are, we're each an end of one on the committee, and it was a relatively small committee. So um, we quickly um, decided that it, it would be nice to know what the field thinks. Maybe this is a bigger problem than we're aware of, or maybe it's not as much of a problem, or maybe it's just uh, compartmentalized where the, where the challenges are. <laughs> Yeah, I would say too, I really, we looked to the final rule first and really looked at what does the language say and then tried to think from different perspectives, how is it going to be implemented? And so we consulted with a lot of different folks working in the in the field, attending veterinarians, IACUC members, how would they roll this plan out and is it working? Um, so that helped us as we were building these these questions. And one of the first questions I wanted to ask is, are you aware of the rule? A lot of times in policy, especially PIs when they're in their, in their labs and we're all in our own bubbles, we often forget all of the rules and regulations surrounding animal research. So that was the, the baseline that we wanted to set. So um, that helped inform the development of our survey. So to follow up on that question, um, how did you ensure that the questions were relevant and comprehensive to your target audience once you had develop the tool. Yeah, we did a short beta test um, with a few people that we consider, um, you know, that we knew would give us honest feedback 
Um, we thought it was a great survey when we put it together, but you know, it's always nice to have a second opinion on that. And uh, tweaked it a little bit based on those responses to try to make it uh, clearer and make sure that it wasn't too um, uh, challenging or time consuming to complete. So. Yeah, the same, the same. We gave it to pe people we knew would give us honest feedback and changed it accordingly. And this is also another question for both surveys. From the data, would you state it is not a burden for the animal research communities? Answer that how you will. So, so I think contingency planning is sort of like buying insurance. You know, it's something that you spend a lot of time and invest a lot of effort into putting together a great plan that you hope you never need to use. So that's sort of like the, the challenge with doing contingency planning is you're doing something that you hopefully sits on a shelf and that never has to be um, exercised or activated. And so I do think it's a burden on, um, this is my opinion, Susan's opinion, but it is a burden just because there's so many pieces to it. And the part that we saw that was sort of getting shortchanged a little bit in this process is the training component, which is every bit as important as the planning part um, because the training and when you're doing the simulations and drills and things like that, that feeds back into the quality of your plan, gives you honest feedback on that. And so if you put all those components together, it does, it is time consuming and it's difficult to justify spending that amount of time on something that you really don't ever want to use. <laughs> so yeah, and I would say I would not think of it as a burden. I think it's a no-brainer that we need to have contingency plans, which is what institutions, many, most institutions already had. Um, I think the thing to look at is, you know, what administrative burden might there be associated with? So I know many people talked about the time frame by which people had to do the different trainings for the new hires or after a plan has been re, uh, renov or renovated, reviewed and refined. Um, and then also, I think I'll, some of the burden would also be people just pondering, what is it USDA wants? You know, what how clear does something have to be? How detailed does something have to be? What specifically do they want to have, you know, see written on a piece of paper? So I think that those would be the burdens, so to speak, that I would see. Um, but I think having a contingency plan, I don't think anyone in this room would disagree is something that we all need to have and probably we all had before this anyhow. Yeah, exactly. I think um, the plan itself is not a burden because it's necessary and it's part of our responsibility to care for the animals. Um, I think the burden comes, it's just as you, there's been a breakdown in the communication between what the USDA wants and what needs to happen on the ground. And it, that's that's where the burden comes in. It's this misinterpretation, this this vague language and how do we do it? Is it, can it be flexible? Can it not be? Um, so I think there are steps we can do to improve that and lessen that gap to, to make it easier on all the different facilities that need these contingency plans. If I could just make one more comment since I look like the outlier now. Um, <laughs> I said it was a burden, but what I, what I should have said, I misspoke, is that it's a lot of work. And you're already asking people who have a lot of responsibilities and they're very busy people to take on this task. It's not like you have you know, somebody who's dedicated and their whole job is just putting together this plan and doing all the other components. So, so it is a lot of work, but I do wholeheartedly agree that they are very necessary. And when you do need to use your, your contingency plan, you're very grateful that you have one. Thank you for that. So one other question is, what do you think of the 30 day requirement considering new hires generally have a lot of training courses to take and probably do not remember all policies considering overload? What, wouldn't it make sense to state 60 days training period? I would say the 30, in my, my opinion, 30 days is super fast. And I know at our institution, just to get someone released to work independently, it's minimum of 60 days just to go do your job. Um, so I don't think we'd be relying on them too heavily during that time if there was an emergency response. So I don't know what the right number is. Uh, 30 sounds awfully early. Uh, and of course it would depend on the institution type. So I know you can't write that in for every rule for different types of institutions. But yeah, it does seem to be awfully quick for many of the reasons that people in their comments and elsewhere have stated. Yeah, it's really hard to put a number on it. And um, I would say though, that I think this is where we, the USDA, you know, with the help of professional societies like FASB, we can put together focus groups and ask, you know, 
what would you like to see? What works well for you? Where, where, what are the areas that are, are hardest for you in terms of onboarding your, your new staff and really kind of figure out from there and then reevaluate the rule and see if that needs to be adjusted a little bit. Um, so going back to the folks that are actively involved in this rather than coming out with a new rule and saying, okay, we changed it to 60, but maybe 60 doesn't quite work for everyone. So I think we, we still need to have that communication first. And, and I would agree. I think that that's something that probably should be looked at again. And it's um, if you think about a new employee and some organizations, you're just burdened with a lot of you know, training just because you're a new employee. So it's not just contingency planning, it's a lot of other things. And because you're sort of overloading their, um, the new employee with all this information, sometimes the most important information isn't retained. So they're it's probably a need to look at that again, maybe phasing it in or maybe doing uh, short snippets, you know, and, um, and building up to um, and reinforcing those and building up to where the person is considered competent. And um, there's a lot of different mechanisms for doing that. So I think it should be more of a performance based outcome than just maybe having a hard point that applies to everybody. Thank you. Next question. As this workshop is a reactive evaluation for the new rule, did the USDA do a preemptive evaluation for the proposal, for the proposed contingency rule with some other questions? If they did, were any of the same issues noted seen in this evaluation, in this evaluation? I don't think I can answer that. I mean, I can't speak on behalf of the USDA, so I'm not yeah. sure. We'll follow up with Lewis about that question. Uh, can you discuss some of the limitations of the survey, particularly those stemming from the anonymous nature of the survey? Can you repeat the question? Sure. Can you discuss some of the limitations of the survey, particularly those stemming from its anonymous nature? No, number one is um, somebody could have completed this, you know, you could have had several individuals at the same institution complete the survey. And so that would have um, skewed your results in favor of how that particular institution felt about this topic. Um, I, looking at the data for our survey, I don't think that that happened. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but it doesn't look like it happened at a high level. Um, the other thing too is, um, you know, I mean, um, Oh, yeah, that, that was the big thing, I guess. Do you have any other? Um, also, multiple people from the same institution might have responded. And, you know, kind of getting to the how long does it take in order to, you know, plan your plan? Uh, it's what that person who responded, what they know of what they did or what their buddies did, not necessarily knowing what everyone in the institution. So for like an example of the amount of time it took to do things, I think it's probably grossly underestimated because, again, you don't know from the you know, president of the institution all the way down, who did what and how much time it took for them. Yeah, that, that's sort of where I was heading and I lost my thought, but it's, you you get the opinion of one person and that may not reflect the institutional level of effort that went into putting the plan together. You're just getting that one person. So that person may have received the plan when it was almost complete and just made some minor tweaks. So it didn't take them as long. Whereas the person who initiated the plan may have put like hours into that product. Yeah, I would say all the same for, for our survey, just the general nature of a survey comes with, with some limitations. Um, but as far as the anonymity, I think that was one of the strengths of it, um, is that we wanted to make sure that they felt comfortable, especially in the written comments, what, what they could share and say. Um, so that really helped us get a sense of what the community was feeling. So, And I would agree with that. I think we got more candid comments because people could, felt free to say, you know, what they really thought. So you always say that anonymity was a strength, not a limitation. Yeah. Yes. We have another comment. Um, I think this was follow up to when we were talking about the 30 day requirement. The comment is we do onboarding with every new hire the first week of work. We include the contingency plan in that training period and make the training available for review. If anyone wants to comment. That's a, that's a good comment. Uh, and I noticed when we did the preliminary surveys before we, we presented the results of our surveys, a lot of the people in the audience had not participated in those surveys. So it's good to hear feedback from this group. I think that kind of talks to, again to what we brought up before of, you know, the first, so I understand totally why they're doing that. They're trying to get their training in within the required period of time. 
but in the first week, they may not even know, you know, the contingency might plan might mention a facility or a room or a room, you know, supplies that they're not even familiar with where they are. Um, so I would, I, I totally understand why people do it quickly as is required, but I think that people are hobbled a little bit with having to do it that quickly. It's worth thinking too that the new staff, you know, they might not be the ones that are highest up on the chain of command. So they may not be as involved in the contingency plan if it needed to be activated. So that is something to keep in mind. But it is, I understand why folks have to try and rush and try to get it all done in one, but you do want it, it's better to give more time and make sure it's done well rather than to rush and, and inundate your new staff with with all the things that they have to be doing. So stuff to keep in mind. Thank you for that. Um, we have a couple more questions and then we'll wrap the session up. Um, were there any significant differences in response rates across different institutional types or regions? I don't we did not sort by region, region of the country. We did not sort by that. We did not ask a question for people to respond that we could sort by that. No, uh, but we we kind of went down a rabbit hole and we're still digging through the data, looking at the FEMA categories, the number of disasters since a time frame, and then looking at responses with the institutions in those regions. So um, stay tuned, I guess, for the FASA report that comes out on that. So we will have likely very some some interesting comments about region and see if that that changes things. Thank you for that. Last question. Were there any surprising or particularly insightful pieces of feedback that stood out to you in looking at the data? I'd say two things that I think came through strongest, I think that we all emphasized was training. Everything that has to do with training is people would like some additional um, information. Uh, documentation, you know, what exactly is the USDA wanting to see written in a plan? Um, and emergency responders. Um, I think people see the value of involving emergency responders or outside authorities, but they're not they're not really sure how to like start the process. You just call and hope someone answers and then you know talk to the right person or you're, what's the process in order to involve them? And I think also some of the um, comments that we got back where people were asking for more resources or reported that this was more of a burden, um, those tended to be the smaller programs. And so we weren't sure what that meant. Also, if we looked at the data, who, who was involved in, in all these different plan components. Um, with the larger institutions, individuals who responded tended to be resp um, responsible for a certain aspect of the plan. Whereas in smaller organizations, they, they one person wore many hats and did everything. And so we weren't sure if that's because, well, the smaller programs have more simplistic programs. So they're process is more concise and uh, it's more straightforward, whereas you have a larger program, it's more complex and uh, takes more time. So we weren't sure how to interpret that, but we did notice that the small programs tended to be the ones asking for more help. I would say two things that really stuck out to us um, was we were really pleased to see the level of coordination across different departments. So folks were talking to the IACUC chairs, as well as the attending veterinarians, as well as the emergency department. Um, and that level of communication was not always present decades ago. Um, so the fact that the animal resource and research team is being more integrated university wide is encouraging. Um, but secondly, we were really surprised to see the inconsistency in what USCA AFIS was communicating on the ground during inspections or whether veterinary medicine officers are, are telling different institutions different things. So there is that breakdown again in that communication between USDA and, and the community. Um, all of the inconsistent reports and the advice that they're getting, and then they have to amend the plans to what that one specific inspector is saying is indicative that maybe there is a lack of consistency on both the institutional side as well as the USDA side that we need to maybe fix. And that's where scientific societies, that's where workshops like this can really be instrumental in help bridging that gap. Uh, but we were really surprised to, to see that. Um, and that creates an additional burden and that's what we wanna try and alleviate, of course. Thank you all for your responses to that. And we have one final question to wrap up the session, or one final comment to wrap up the session. This again is going back to, I think, talking about the 30 day requirement. Um, the comment is, I would posit that the new hire doesn't need to be fully pre 
proficient in the complete contingency plan, but rather need to know how to report problems to the appropriate supervisor or veterinarian. That's a great comment. Thank you. Okay, well then we will end it on that, on a positive note. Um, we are going to break for lunch at this time and we will rejoin at 1 p.m. Eastern time to begin with the afternoon sessions. Thank you, everyone.